this year. So I'm really delighted to um, have uh, the, the opportunity to moderate this next panel with, with three just terrific panelists. I mean, we've, we've just had a, an amazing day with such richness of uh, insights and input and wisdom. Uh, and I can assure you, you're going to get some more over the next 40 minutes as well. So I'm joined this afternoon um, from, from left to right by Katrina Pielli, who is uh, at USAID, uh, the US um, Agency for International Development, uh, where she heads up um, part of the President's Power Africa initiative that is specifically focused on um, what they call beyond the grid. So really looking at the role of uh, clean, um, uh, particularly small scale, uh, renewable energy solutions, um, both distributed, rooftop, um, small-scale energy products, as well as uh, microgrids, to help bring energy access to, um, they have a goal of, I think, 60 million people um, over the next few years uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as part of our overall goal, which was uh, adopted um, by the UN uh, uh, in September of last year, really to try and make a big dent in getting to universal energy access um, by 2030 for the 1.1 billion people around the world who don't have uh, electricity and the benefits from electricity, as well as another billion who may have electricity but may have poor power quality and so don't get the full benefits of it. So Katrina joins us from Pretoria, um, where she uh, uh, is leading um, that work across Africa. And then next to her, another uh, woman who uh, probably needs no introduction is Kathy Zoy, who um, is just another powerhouse um, who has been uh, in the administration. She was with the White House. Um, she served as an assistant secretary of uh, energy as well and uh, has just, a, and I'm probably getting it slightly wrong, but is now, uh, music to my heart, uh, is an entrepreneur um, who has just... Uh, this last week, um, formalized a, 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 a company that she has, um, that has been named uh, Access Energy to focus on energy access um, and uh, is really looking at how we deploy um, uh, smart uh, microgrids um, to contribute to bringing electricity and I think particularly um, initially in Asia um, and in East Africa. And then uh, Nicole Poindexer, who is uh, the CEO of uh, Energicity, is also focusing very much on the role. We kind of have a theme on mini grids a little bit in this panel because Katrina is doing work on mini grids as well. But also looking at uh, distributed um, mini grids as a way to bring, um, and particularly using solar power as a way to bring uh, energy to. Um, uh, to communities also in, in West Africa um, and specifically focusing in Ghana. And she's going to be telling us a little bit more about that as well uh, in the course of the discussion. So I'm just delighted because one of the things that we really see, and, and I've been working on energy access issues um, for, I will admit, to a decade, but actually um, longer than that. And we've really seen a sea change in the sector in the last 10 years. And I would say that one of the, I was just saying, one of the early um, companies that came into the small-scale uh, off-grid solar lighting sector uh, was actually a Stanford um, uh, design school business plan idea, and one of the founders called me up when he was, it was a guy, but he was still in uh, Stanford um, to pitch me the business idea, which has now become a company that many of you will know called D-Light, which is one of the leading uh, small-scale off-grid lighting companies. So for those of you who are students, um, any students here this afternoon? So um, 10 years from now, you may be one of the leading uh, off-grid energy companies. Um, so uh, please go, go with your passion, uh, listen and learn and create your business plans here and then run with them um, because it can work. Um, one of the other things on this panel also is that we have a representation of both policy and um, entrepreneurship. And that's really key as well, because for us to solve this whole issue of uh, electrification and energy access, um, it really requires smart policy, it requires innovation um, in financing, in how we get it done, and it also um, really helps uh, to have a strong focus on how we can help to move the market um, and move the needle on entrepreneurship. And, uh, 
so, so we, have, we have the panel uh, representing uh, both policy and practice. So I want, without further ado, I want to turn over now to, to our panelists and just say, to kick it off, um, first of all, um, for those who perhaps are less familiar with the international context, you could talk about why, why energy is so critical in this context. You know, some people say, well, uh, you know, the fact that they haven't had electricity, why is it such a big deal? Um, and how we can enable developing countries really to develop the sustainable businesses so that um, we can help to, to um, strengthen their economies, particularly at the local level. And, and how does renewable energy fit into that? So maybe, Nicole, you could, you could kick off with a few thoughts, and then we'll uh, uh, invite Cathy and Katrina to, to make their remarks as well. Sure. Um, so, as, as Rachinda said, I focus on West Africa and specifically Ghana, um, which is a market that I fell into somewhat accidentally. I was, you know, friend of a friend, university connections make friends with people here. Um, that's useful. But, um, and, you know, the context in Ghana, and I'd say in much of Africa, Ghana actually has a very high level of electrification at 75% electrification, which means one out of four people do not have electricity at all. And of the, one, the, three, the three quarters that do have electricity, they have blackouts 36 hours out of 48. So you imagine running your life. You don't have a refrigerator. My guy that works for me, he's trying to send me an email with a whole bunch of data. Every time he tries to start the email, the power goes out. So he can't send an email. You can't run your business when the power is available. The cost of power is about 50 cents a kilowatt hour. So businesses are going out of business under that duress. Um, they're, um, you can't keep food in your refrigerator. Like every aspect, of, you can't charge your cell phone. Every aspect of life that you are familiar with is impossible with that level of either not having power at all or not having stable, reliable power. And so we started our business because we thought that one, with the advances in both renewable technology, but also um, this crisis, that we could actually make a real difference, and that there was a big gap between the cost for us to provide electricity and the costs that people were experiencing in their lives by not having electricity. And um, you know, set forth to begin this business model that's uh, actually taken off. There's a huge amount of demand for it. Um, and it's, um, it's really exciting to see the transformation you can cause in people's lives from very, very small things to, as Rashinda was saying, is the ability to start to save businesses that currently exist, um, but also to start new businesses and new economic um, foundation, new supply chains. Um, a lot of our customers are farmers. And in Africa, it is said that over 50% of crops rot for lack mm -hmm. of cold storage. Now, again, this is a continent that has huge issues with hunger. 50% of their crops rot in the fields or in transport because there's no cold storage. So what we're able to provide is cold storage because all you need is electricity. Um, and then there's also just disrupting the supply chains a lot, and then I'll stop talking. But a lot of my, um, a lot of my customers are cocoa farmers. And cocoa farmers make currently about one penny per pound of cocoa. I happen to love chocolate, or per one pound of chocolate, and I happen to love chocolate. Uh, so I spend $18 per pound of chocolate. That's a huge gap. And it's because the people, the cocoa farmers are dealing with the very, very raw product. Um, the next two steps in the production cycle, all they require is electricity and capital to finance the equipment but we can provide the electricity. So now these cocoa farmers who are at the bottom end of that value chain now are able to expand to the next two levels, which coincidentally, um, it dramatically decreases the shipping costs. So actually everyone in the, in the supply chain profits by this transformation that's enabled by electricity. So with that, I'll let other people jump in. But. Sure. So um, I'll, I'll own up to 30 years in the sector, <laughs> but not, not the energy access sector. I've been doing um, energy and environmental stuff, where the nexus between policy and technology and finance for 30 years. And, but for the last 12 months, I have focused exclusively on rural electrification and off-grid. 
Um, why? Um, Everybody says the 1.1 billion plus another billion don't have enough electricity. I just want to pause for a second and let's have everybody think about how many zeros that is of people that have no lights at night, no refrigeration for medicine, no way to charge the cell phone. I mean, it, it, is, it is astonishing. That is so many people. So there's, there's that, that one gigantic thing that's, oh my gosh, this is a really huge problem to solve. Now, why did I get excited about sort of putting my um, energy toward this um, is, is that a couple things. One is, as um, Nicole mentioned, the costs have come down for the technologies by 80% in the last few years. So that's like, wow. The people in the villages are paying more for diesel than, they're paying, than they would have to pay for solar if we could get it to them. They're paying more for kerosene and it's causing health problems than they would have to pay for solar if we can get it to them. Right, so that's sort of, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in 1984, I did a stint with UNIDO, working in Vienna, but on an Energy for Africa project. And the same numbers were big and were there. And solar was more expensive. There were other alternatives that weren't quite as expensive. But the single biggest thing that has made me very, very, very bullish that we can crack this is that now, roughly 80 to 90% of people in sub-Saharan Africa and in rural parts of India and other places have cell phones. Five years ago, seven years ago, nobody would have predicted that those people who are very, very poor, who don't have much disposable income, would have enough money to buy minutes, and they do. And they didn't predict that there would be businesses that would evolve that could service those people, but there are. So if you can do it with cell phones, then I believe that we, collectively, in this room, the folks who care about it, who know about technology and finance and policy, can make this happen and can solve it. Well, I'm just happy to say that we are actively working with all three of these ladies, and I actually used to work for Kathy at the Department of Energy, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, we used um, to work down the hall, and now she's in Pretoria. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, I, I do just want to echo everything they've said, um, and really just to sort of put a finer point on it, the energy and access to energy is really critical to actually lifting up and enabling poverty reduction. Um, you heard Nicole say it, but it's, it's productive use of energy. It can actually give someone the opportunity to generate an income and it can change their lives. Um, I think the other thing that I would mention is really just around the fact that when we as Power Africa, as Rachenda mentioned, is really a coalition that's led by the US government, but brings in partnerships with 10 other donor agencies and countries, over 140 <coughs> private sector companies, um, and others into the tent. And what we did is an analysis that shows in 2030, 80 million people in sub-Saharan Africa will still be too remote to have access to the grid. So the focus on companies like uh, Nicole's and Kathy's is critical for us as donors to be enabling the private sector to actually do the work that's necessary to provide the ability for the African and Asian and across the world population to actually take advantage of what is available now, sun, hydro, wind, et cetera. Um, the only other thing I'd add quickly is that the focus on solar home systems and mini grids and microgrids for us as Power Africa is really driven by private sector and where the private sector is going. Um, you heard Kathy mention that technology costs have dropped. That also then when you pair that up with the fact that there's increasing amounts of financing that's interested in the energy access space, it really does provide kind of the right moment in time to make that step change that you heard folks talk about. Thanks, and can I give a shout out also to, to the work that's going on at DOE as well with some of the super efficient appliances. Um, I just served as a judge for an awards process where we were looking at some really cool 10 watt off-grid LED TVs. So that's also, the appliance side is also helping to enable these technologies further. And actually we have a really cool announcement with DOE tomorrow or Thursday on this very topic. So stay tuned, um, we're super excited about it. Terrific, thanks <laughs> Katrina. So, so specifically coming back, um, since, since we are uh, here as C3, um, let's talk about the women factor in terms of the entrepreneurship, um, in, uh, specifically in energy access. Um, I have to say that uh, in the past at least, um, I really wasn't seeing enough uh, women-led enterprises, uh, seeing a lot of focus on solutions of, of companies. And again, I'm going over the last 10 years, I won't admit to Cathy's 30, I'm just sticking with 10. <laughs> um, 
but really a lot of focus on women as the beneficiaries. And I got somewhat frustrated with some of these companies who were saying, you know, women, women, women beneficiaries, and I would look at their boards, and I would look at their management structure and say, um, actually, uh, how come you're all focusing on women beneficiaries and there's not even one woman uh, in your management, in your board? So, um, and it's changing, and that's great. You know, and here's, um, we've got some great women entrepreneurs on this panel. So, so just, you know, what role can women play um, as business leaders in helping to catalyze this change? Um, and also, um, other than money, um, including the money, what do you need to be successful? Um, obviously, financing is, is part of it, but, but what else? Um, and you can talk about the financing too. So maybe Nicole and, and Kathy can start with that one. We can come back to Katrina. Well, I would, I would just, so the way we work um, at Access Energy is that we are not the developer in the local area ourselves. We, we partner with others. And I would say that over the past 12 months, I've gotten to know lots and lots and lots of local development companies. And there's three that I'm super excited about. And I would have to say, and I, and I, didn't, I hadn't thought of this until Rachenda posed this question, but all three of those companies have women in the leadership, not necessarily as a CEO, but as a part, like this, a woman is a COO. We've just, we've just in, our, in our own company, we had, we've just hired a GM for Africa who's a, who's a woman who's a, a former entrepreneur who, who developed a chocolate business in Tanzania. Um, and, um, and she's now, she's so excited about electricity. And, and the, same, the same is true with, with our, one of our favorite partners in India, is that, that women are absolutely part of the leadership team. You contrast that to, um, I don't, and I don't, particularly when you go into rural villages in India, where it is, when well, we have a town hall meeting, we have a community meeting and everybody comes along, do we talk about, you know, look, if we're gonna build this mini grid here, then you're gonna to have to pay for it. It's not the government coming along and doing it. You're gonna have, have a power bill. It's gonna be, you know, an, a monthly fee to have all of these services. It is the men and the children that come along to those town hall meetings. The women are not allowed to come in, in rural mm -hmm. India. Um, it's interesting when I'm walking through the villages because I'm the only kind of woman walking through. I don't, I mean, there's nothing that we can do about that particular thing, but I, what I am hopeful of is when we, and the stories are, and you guys may know the stories better than me, when electricity comes, it is often an empowering thing because women can start to have businesses and have a source of income that augments the agricultural incomes, which, is very, which are difficult um, to get out of poverty. Um, but that's a longer-term sociological thing. So uh, women leadership at the entrepreneurial level, we're really excited about. Um, so I do go into the villages. Um, and um, I, 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 like that's, I'm the developer you would work with. Um, and I would say, being a woman, and I can only speak from my experience, I, I'm always tempted to make generalizations about women as a whole, and that really usually goes very wrong. Um, but I will say, for myself, like, in my life, I have almost always been the one woman or the one black person in pretty much every environment that I've been in. And um, what I see when I go into these completely different environments, um, where they, funnily enough, call me white person, um, like, that's my name. And, um, but I can be with it. Like, it, it is an easy thing to be with because I have always been an outsider. I have always been someone who has been somewhat outside, been able to suss out a situation, figure out who the power players are, figure out, like, who I need to listen to to actually make the change. And, learn, and I've learned how to talk to many different types of people in a voice that actually they are able to listen to. And... Um, Anyone can develop that set of skills, but I'd have to say that like my life experiences have been why that, that set of skills have been so important to me. And I use them every day when I'm in a village. Um, and so it's, um, I, I, I think that there is a great advantage to being a woman in, in these frontier environments. Um, it, it's just about having the boldness to go out and do it. Actually, if, if I could just add a couple of, of points on that. Um, so the idea of what role should women play, they should play in every role. 
And there's some great work happening actually in West Africa with ECOWAS, the West African um, Country Association. They have actually a gender mainstreaming policy. And what was great is last week at a meeting um, in Kenya, a representative from the Ghanaian Ministry of Energy, when uh, he was asked, well, what do you hear for, what, what do you want to get out of this meeting? One of the things he shortlisted was gender mainstreaming and what other countries were doing on it. And to me, that was pretty amazing, because when you looked around that table, there wasn't a single woman at the table, which is a problem, but the fact that that was on his shortlist was the first time I'd ever heard that. So good stuff happening with ECOWAS with their policy. It's filtering out to the countries. Still work to be done, but positive steps. Um, and the other interesting point that I'd mention is um, a private sector developer was talking a lot about capacity building and training. And he was saying when he goes to villages, he actually is seeking out local women as workforce. And in his words, because when the guy doesn't want to go to work, no one goes to work. When the woman is sick or the child is sick, the neighbors pitch together and someone goes to work. So he was saying that the women from his local workforce development standpoint were actually more valuable workers. And that was also something really interesting to me that I hadn't heard. And it just shows kind of the shifts that are happening. Because a number of years ago, you probably wouldn't have heard a private sector developer say they're seeking out uh, women in the local workforce and how exciting that was to him. Terrific. And, and I, as you're talking as well, I, I was just thinking about the first C3E awardee um, that we, um, back in 2010, 2011, who I think is in the room, Laura Statchell, who's also working on uh, addressing uh, energy access and um, focusing specifically on health uh, applications um, for women who uh, in the past would um, be asked in some countries to go and take a candle with them to give birth uh, because there was no power to light the delivery. So we're talking entrepreneurship, but we're also looking at, at public sector applications as well. So let's just come back uh, for a moment to, to the village setting. So, so let's talk solutions. So can, can we do a little bit of a deeper dive on, on what are the solutions? Um, what, are, what types of infrastructure? How are you making it happen? Um, how is it structured at, at the village level for those communities? Sure. Well, I'll... So um, our, our stack is very simple, I should say. Um, it's you know a, a traditional solar stack. So it's solar, inverter. We've got storage um, to provide power 24 hours a day, although in most of our communities we're providing from 6 AM to 10 PM. Um, and, um, and then we've got poles and wires to the house and a smart meter. Um, one of the innovations that we're working on now is to make our smart meters dumber. And um, our goal is to take all the intelligence out of the smart meter. And what the evolution of the smart metering industry has been to put as much intelligence into the smart meter and package it with this really convoluted software program that the meter vendor sells with it and it becomes a very expensive package. That is a cost structure that's completely unsustainable for people who are using, you know, 300 watt hours a day. And so instead what we're doing is all we want is a meter that communicates the data and receives commands. And that's it. Um, we don't even want it to store data. We just want that basic capability. So we're actually trying to um, reverse engineer a lot of what's happened in the industry so that we can actually build products that are more cost effective for lower lower consumers. Yeah, so after spending a year doing lots of work, I, I wasn't in Ghana, but we did, we did spend some time in Senegal and in rural India and in East Africa as well. Um, I and a couple of my colleagues came to the conclusion that the single biggest contribution that a global company can make, one who's not doing the work on the ground, because there's so much of this that really needs to be done on the ground, but what can we do is we can package up a system that is way cheaper than what it is than what most developers have to pay now. So we've got it's a, it's, it's a turnkey platform. It's got four things. First thing is it is solar plus storage in a box that is somewhere between 35 and 50 percent less than any developer we've talked to is getting it for right now. Um, the second thing is it it comes with um, it comes with the operating system. Think think you you, you buy your your Mac, you buy your MacBook and you open it up and you get iOS. We have, we, our box comes with an operating system that is, that is based in the cloud, that, operate, that updates automatically, right? And, that, and that, so it just comes with it. The third thing you get with our, with our offering is you get apps. Again, we, we, we like the Apple 
analogy, obviously, but, but what are the tools that a local developer would need to, <coughs> to size the system right and their web-based tools? Size the system right, what are the pricing structures? What do we know about all of the mini grids that have been done around the world about what pricing will work for in certain demographics? Um, where, how can things be cited? And then the, the, the fourth thing that we provide in our platform system is um, finance, which is access to debt. And so the, what we're hoping to do is be able to, and this is the first time I've met Nicole, but maybe Nicole and I will figure out a way to work together. What we're hoping to do is make it easier for local developers to do business, to get rolling, to make money, and to be in their local environments where, frankly, the national governments would much prefer to have lots of local folks doing it, not multinational companies swanning around and doing it. So that's, that's, the, that's the offering that Access Energy has, and we're pretty excited about it. So Katrina, um, and that's terrific. Thanks, Kathy and Nicole. Katrina, um, at Power Africa, you kind of sit in a slightly different place. What kind of solutions? I mean, Power Africa is kind of solution agnostic, but what are you seeing that's working? That's in, uh, it's not one of your questions, so I'm putting you on the spot here, but, but what, are you, what are you seeing that are some of the uh, innovations and solutions that are really taking hold um, across Sub-Saharan Africa now? Sure. So the big one that if you've heard much of anything about solar in Africa, you've probably heard of something called pay as you go, um, which is really sort of the big interesting thing that was sort of a game changer for household solar, which basically enables or empowers the customer to actually purchase as much power as they want to use at any given moment. So it allows them to really be in charge of what it is they're paying for and what it is they're using and how they're using it. So that was a game changer there. We're still looking for that same game changer for the mini grid or microgrid market. Um, so I think sort of what we're seeing there, which is really exciting, is the continued drop in the technology cost, because that's critical. Uh, and then also just the really rapid increase in the number of financing organizations, so from family foundations to commercial banks, to impact investors who are keen to actually move into the mini-grid and micro-grid sector. Um, some large commercial banks are actually looking for data on repayment of customers so that they can actually feel more comfortable to provide um, working capital loans or debt, in some cases equity, into these companies. So that's really exciting. Um, the other thing that's sort of what's working is when the national policymakers actually get it right in terms of the enabling environment. Um, we're working with three countries now on the legal framework for mini grids and micro grids in terms of tariff setting and then what happens if and when a central grid reaches a mini grid. And those two things really truly do unlock kind of the potential for companies like Kathy's and Nicole's to actually make a business helping the local communities. So that's the other thing that I think is really working is when the, the countries get it right. Well, I would say absent the right policies and regulatory settings, nobody will finance you that's right. because it's too risky, yeah. right? I mean, it's already a risky enough setting without having the, the sort of, the, I often hear it, the threat of, well, when the grid gets there, then this is going to go bust, and so we won't do it. And what's what's interesting, and Katrina alluded to, the, alluded to this, there's there's 46 billion dollars of energy access capital waiting to be put to work in good places that are that are bankable and financeable, but the ticket sizes for the kinds of things that Nicole and I think about are somewhere between 100 and 200 thousand dollars. Meanwhile, the smallest ticket sizes for the big institutions tend to be in the millions. So there's a bit of a mismatch. So one of the things that I'm looking forward to in the next year, I mean, we'll, we'll establish this debt facility, but there'll be others so that there can be a clearinghouse so that the, so that the, the you know, a mini grid or, 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 or a bunch of solar home systems can get funded much more easily without the paperwork, right? Because it just takes, it takes 18 months to get these things through and times are wasting. Yeah, it's true. We had an investor forum last week of um, Power Africa Partners, and the smallest amount that a company um, had requested was $50,000, and literally all of the investors in the room said, okay, so who else is interested in, in talking to us? It was, I mean, $30 million, $5 million, it, it's, there's really a mismatch, and that's where the donors, I think, can come in and be helpful, but yeah, absolutely. So plea to all of the impact investors in the room, please, uh, Swallow your own transaction costs and go for the smaller amounts because that will be transformational to the entrepreneurs Absolutely. in the room. We're going to turn it now to all of you um, for some questions um, for the remainder of, of the session. So uh, if you can just put up your hand and uh, say who you are and a, and a brief question here at the front, we'll start. Uh, um, if there's a mic. Maxine, here we go. Okay. I'll oh, okay. First. Okay. We'll, we'll go. Um, so, uh, thanks very much. Really interesting. So, I have a question on the business models for the um, 
some of the industrial applications. And you gave a great example of the cocoa grind, you know, the cocoa farmer who, if they could grind and, you know, process the, the cocoa, they'd make more money. Um, similarly, the issue of food loss is a huge one. Uh, where refrigeration or cold storage could make a really big difference. But if you look at both of those applications, they are probably not something where you would need uh, to have a, you know, a system in place all the time. And so the, I'm just curious what, what work is going on with regard to business models for those kind of applications. So one, that's something we're working out. Um, second is when we're when we look at those types of uses, we're looking at it in the context of an entire community. Um, and so I'll, I'll give a different specific example, um, which is several of our communities are also grain farmers. Um, and um, there's also a clinic in this one particular grain farming community. And so the clinic has sterilizers that are used and they use an insane amount of energy for a very short period of time. And the farmers actually want to use their grain mills, or they would like to have grain mills. The nice thing is that both those things have similar peaks, but you can actually manage the loads and manage the timing of when people use them so that you actually smooth out the load so we can actually build less capacity to provide the same quality of service within certain parameters. And so, yes, coffee, cocoa roasting isn't done all year long. Grain milling isn't necessarily done all year long. But we think with the portfolio approach and with that portfolio including the entire community and all the community's uses, we can actually manage peak much more efficiently. Easier view? I think, well, we can talk offline. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll take a... Yeah. Um, at the front first. I'm Tao Guan from Cummings. Um, yeah, this is so exciting to see that so many people are building the microgrids and deliver the energy to the developing countries. My question is, uh, what are some of the risks that, yeah, uh, one thing I com came to my mind is, do you worry about vandalization or, yeah, thank you. So my list of, list of risks will be much shorter than the list that you would get if you asked my mom. So that's the first thing. Um, so I, for the systems themselves, yeah, vandalism, this might be a particular aspect of Ghanaian culture, but we have had absolutely no problems. We, what, we had one panel break that might have been a kid throwing a rock, but other than that, um, and the panel was under warranty, but other than that, we haven't had any problems. So, I mean, to our physical infrastructure, not much. There's some weather phenomenon that um, could potentially d damage the equipment, but we've been able to manage that with uh, careful maintenance. And um, you know, beyond that, the risks to the business, I think, are more in the realm of the regulatory. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a big election, or a presidential election coming up, uh, this fall that will likely only improve things, but nonetheless, you know, I feel very susceptible to political risk, um, which I would feel less so here. One of the, one of the risks that is often raised is the risk of non-payment. Uh, because you're talking many of the local villagers, if you're doing a mini grid or you're doing a solar home system for somebody at the, who, who's below the poverty line, then will they, will they be able to pay? And I mean, what we tend to do is we model, model, we model very conservatively. So if we go into an area, we actually only assume that 65% of the people are going, that are there are going to subscribe, and that's to the base program, which is just one light and a phone charger. And we're charging less than, than they're paying for kerosene or diesel. So by the time you factor that in, now there still might be some turnover, but you, you sort of just count on that. So we handle the risk of non-payment by just modeling very, very conservatively. And we also size the systems right. So that's one of our proprietary tools is that we've got a really good sizer so that, because what you can end up, your business can go down the gurgler if you spend too much capex that you don't need to and, no, and there's no demand. So the beautiful thing about this, mod, this modular stuff, as Nicole will attest to, is that underestimate demand, but then you just make a phone call and you get, you get some more solar supply. So it's actually really, really pretty easy. Um, and I, I, I agree that sort of, I, maybe your mother, it's my husband, has a longer list of risks. I mean, yeah. I think a couple things to add on that. Um, in some of the countries where there was high adoption of solar a number of years ago, in a lot of those instances, the panels weren't 
maintained properly, the batteries failed, and so there's a real perception issue um, among many folks that solar just doesn't work. And so that's a risk from sort of an adoption standpoint, is how do you actually um, mobilize these companies with business models that include O&M that can actually make sure these systems have longevity. So how do you change the villager's mind um, that these are now viable? Um, I think just to reinforce the political risk significantly, there's a huge discussion in East Africa now around force majeure and what would happen if the government just decides, you know what, we're gonna extend the grid and we're just gonna take over your mm -hmm. system. So that's a, a huge issue, both from the financing standpoint and from the private sector developer standpoint as well. Yeah, and definitely, I mean, that's one I can speak to as well. We've, we've seen uh, from the business side, particularly, they're worried about whether they get compensation or whether they just lose the business. And um, so definitely a, a real, real-time issue. Um, last few minutes remaining. Um, let's end on an up note. What are the opportunities um, that you see coming up, uh, particularly for developing countries um, in the energy access sector uh, in the coming years? Um, just uh, some final thoughts from each of you. Maybe well, we'll, I'll, we'll... I'll go first. So, uh, I, I'm really excited about the, the entrepreneurs that we're going to see doing this at the local level. I mean, I just, I, I just feel like if we, can, if we crack the cost and the, the availability of the technology code, then I think that, that this is going to be a great business. I mean, I've been in rural villages in, in India where there's, there's almost nothing, but there's always one or two guys that have it's kind of jerry-rigged a diesel gen set and put wires around the houses near them, and they're the entrepreneurs. And we said, look, if we brought a mini-grid here, would you run the mini-grid? And they say, yes, 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 yes. It just is, I'm so excited about the opportunity for the economic development once we can bring the power. Yeah, and just building on that, just the partnerships that we're seeing emerging and the, both the new entrants, but also just the exciting ways that people are looking to work together. So telecom, energy, local entrepreneurs, it's just a really exciting time. I think that to me is what's most interesting to watch and to be a part of is just to see how the different pieces are coming together. And I would just add, it's sort of building on the cocoa farming point, um, just the, the huge opportunity to transform these economies. Um, you know, without power, you are really hamstrung. I, I heard Kanda Yumkela um, speak recently, and he said that the first industrial revolution was powered by Africa's labor through slavery or colonialization. The second and third were powered through Africa's resources. And the question is, what is the role that Africa is going to play, or was this? Were they, are they going to have a seat at the table in the fourth? And the table stakes is whether or not they have power. And that's what's so exciting to me about this, is that that's something that we now have the technology to do, and we have people who have the will to do it, um, you know, be it local entrepreneurs or be it people in this room. And I think that's what's so profoundly exciting, is that we have the opportunity to pull a, co a continent out of extreme poverty just by this one act. Wow, what a great vision just to see um, pulling um, pulling a whole continent uh, through, through empowerment. So please join me for thanking this fabulous panel of power players. So terrific.